Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast, episode number 78. We have David A. Souza, an international educational consultant and author of more than 16 books that suggest ways that educators and parents can translate current brain research into strategies to improve learning. It was David Souza's How the Brain Learns book series. It's now in its fourth edition, but it includes how the brain learns, how the brain learns to read, how the gifted brain learns, how the special needs brain learns, that I was given by an educator when I was urged to add the most current brain research into my program. When reading this series, I was told from other respected colleagues that this book series is one that every educator should read. It also helped me as a parent of a struggling reader to understand my own child and how she's learning to read, giving me some secrets and some patience to help put into practice some of these secrets for accelerating literacy that I'll share throughout this interview. I also discovered how the ELL brain learns that helped me to create a webinar for an educational publisher to skyrocket literacy and achievement. And there's also differentiation in the brain and how the brain learns mathematics. Then there's the leadership brain that suggests ways for educators and how they can lead more effectively in today's schools. David Sousa also has a book for educators called Engaging the Rewired Brain that examines how technology changes the way students' brains function and how educators can adapt instruction to keep students motivated. Then there's the power of student teams achieving social, emotional, and cognitive learning in every classroom through academic teaming that describes a path to predictable success for every student in every classroom and every school, all backed by student data, neuroscience research, and experiences from superintendents, school leaders, teachers, and students who've all made the shift teaching through the power of student teams. David is a member of the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, has conducted workshops in hundreds of school districts on brain research, instructional skills, and science education at the K-12 to university levels, Welcome, David. Thank you so much for being here today. It feels so surreal after studying your books for all these years. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, David, I really don't think I would have understood how the brain learns enough to teach it to others without your book series. And I was given this series six years ago. And at first, when I was reading it, I didn't get the grasp of how the brain works instantly. It wasn't like I read the books and aha, here it is and let's go move into teaching this. It felt a little bit intimidating at the beginning, to be honest, when I first opened it and saw all the charts and I don't have a neuroscience background. My background is in education. But I was lucky enough to have a neuroscience researcher who helped me with my questions and walked me through everything enough so that I got it. But can you go back to you before you had written this book series and explain why you wrote it and maybe thinking about how were you going to address people like me who might be afraid of the complexity of the topic? Sure. Let me start by saying uh, we are not trying to make neuroscientists out of teachers. What we're trying to do is have them understand that we're discovering a lot in recent years about how the brain learns. And since that's what teachers do every day, trying to convince a brain to learn, the more they know about how it works, the better off, more successful they're likely to be. This started back in the 80s, 1980s. Um, I had been a science teacher. I taught high school chemistry and biology. Um, And, I got very interested as a scientist in the kinds of discoveries they were making thanks to the invention of uh, brain imaging uh, apparatus and instruments. And I began to realize as I read, I was fascinated to read reports. And I was really interested in noticing that some of these reports had to do with learning. Because in the past, um, we used in the 70s when these imaging machines first came out, we used them mainly to look at brains that had problems, that, were, that had stroke or uh, Alzheimer's or some other disease. It wasn't until more, more of the imaging devices became available and cheaper that scientists began to look at, let's say, the typical brain. 
and how the typical brain works. And um, I began to realize that we're, they were learning things about how the brain learns and how it organizes itself that would be useful to people who try to do that every day, and that's teachers. Uh, most teachers that I knew in the training that I had gotten, although I was trained as a chemist, I did have to take some education courses in order to get a teaching certificate. We, you know, we learned mostly behavioral psychology because that's all we knew at the time. And um, that was okay for then, but uh, we had begun to learn a lot more since then. And so anybody who just had a behavioral psychology kit bag in the classroom was really behind the times and not understanding new things we're learning about the brain and how it learns. So uh, I met a woman by the name of uh, Madeline Hunter back in the middle eight, 1980s. She was a clinical psychologist who became the head of the um, uh, school at the University of uh, California, Los Angeles, UCLA school. And uh, as a clinical psychologist, she began to realize that the teachers who were coming into her school didn't know much about the brain at all, except a little bit about Piaget and a little bit about Pavlov and his dogs and uh, not much else. So uh, she and I, had, I met her at a, at a conference, but very interested in her work because she said teachers have to know more about what we're learning about the brain. At that point in the mid 1980s, I decided that I was going to really look into what we're learning about the brain. And it wasn't until a few years later when I really felt that I had uh, trained myself, that I had taken some courses, that I really understood the impact that what we're learning in, uh, in brain research, what parts of that had implications for what we do in, in schools and classrooms. Of course, when I started to talk to teachers about that, they thought, oh, you know, this is too difficult for me to understand. <laughs> um, and I thought, no, it isn't. There ought to be a way that we can get you to understand this. And so I thought, if I could write books that would uh, take the relatively complex understanding of brain learning and write it in a way that most teachers, non-scientific teachers, could understand it, that would be a service. So... Um, and, and Madeline Hunter, Dr. Hunter, encouraged me to do that. So the first book came out in 95, and it, um, How the Brain Learns, first edition, and it took off, that's How the Brain Learns to Read. Oh, yeah, the other one was How the Brain Learns, yeah. And uh, that, um, yeah, that's it. That's now in its fifth edition. Uh, it just took off like crazy because teachers began to realize, hey, there's stuff here I didn't know that could be helpful in what I do every day in the classroom. So um, one thing led to another, and then the more I studied it, the more neuroscientists I talked to. And I must say, not every one of the neuroscientists I talked to were in favor of this. They thought, well, teachers are not smart enough to understand this. Don't, you know, don't upset them with this stuff. And I thought that was a bit condescending. And uh, that made me... Um, have even more desire to write about this stuff in a way that teachers could understand it. And I guess the best compliment I get, at least in my opinion about my books, is that I've written about complicated stuff in a way that most, most teachers can understand, uh, can understand it and recognize its importance. So that's how we get started. Yep. I love it. I love it because you converted me. And when, when I was reading it, I love how each book starts with a practitioner's corner. So it assesses your current knowledge of reading or myths about giftedness or the special needs brain to bring out some important differences of how the brain learns. Can you explain what happens in the brain when a child is learning to read? Like I found this very helpful with my daughter when I'm sitting with her to look at her in this way and know what's going on inside her brain so that we, we can just understand how is a gifted brain different than an ELL brain and what's actually happening when the student is looking at the words on the page and then speaking those words. Yeah, it's a very complex process actually. Um, and, and remember that school districts uh, and, and private schools too, the area they spend the most money on is reading because every couple of years another reading program comes out and they all gotta do that. And, um, we always have to update what we're doing here. Uh, some of it, of course, uh, is, um, is wasted money, in my opinion, because it, it, they, there are books on the market that are not up to date on how understanding how the brain learns to read. So let me help you with this. Keep in mind that um, the human brain is pre-wired for certain skills. 
as a result of our development as a species. Uh, one of those is spoken language. We learned as a, as a species, like many other animal species have, that by communicating with one another verbally or by some method of communication, we can help the group. We can warn them of, of predators, we can um, attract a mate to prolong the species, we can find food and tell others where there's food to keep, uh, keep us going. Uh, so we have specialized areas in the brain, right? One behind the left temple called Broca's area and one behind the left ear called Wernicke's area. And those specialized areas are designed to acquire spoken language. So we're pre-wired for that. That's why toddlers start speaking very early and imitating sounds very early because they have their brain that's wired to do that. That happens because of survival skills. Uh, remember that the brain's main job, two main jobs. One, keep us alive. And number two, meet a member of the opposite sex so we can prolong the, uh, propagate the species. That's it. So the brain is really pre-wired for survival and sex. And if you have a teenager at home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, there is no reading part of the brain because that's not a survival skill. Um, so when we try to learn to read, we have to co-op parts of the brain that are designed to do other things in order to try to read. And it's not easy because remember, what you're saying to a child, remember a child is speaking long before they learn to read. They started to acquire vocabulary words. They started to understand differences in sounds. They recognize different phonemes as we call them. And now we say to them after they've been practicing that language for several years, we say, guess what? We have devised a way to put that language into writing. And we do that by having some arbitrary symbols that we have invented. They don't exist in a real world. We invented them. They're called the alphabet. Now, the neat thing about this and the surprising thing is we have about 50 sounds in our language, but we only have 26 symbols. So sometimes we have to use the same symbol to represent different sounds, and sometimes the same sound is represented by different symbols. Isn't that fun? And of course, the typical brain is saying, what are you talking about? No, this is not fun at all. It sounds like work. Now, uh, so what happens is when we try to get the human brain to assign a sound called a phoneme to a letter or group of letters called a, graph, called a grapheme, what we're trying to do is say to the brain, we want you to associate this sound with this um, symbol or group of symbols. And the brain does not have a way to do that because there's no reading part of the brain. So what it does is co-ops a part of the brain called the angular gyrus, which is right about here. And that's the part of the brain that assigns meaning to symbols. For example, or, or to shapes, I should say. If you're driving down the street, a dark street, it's the middle of the night, and at the end of the street, you see this octagonal sign. You can't read it. But the brain right away tells you, I think you're going to have to stop when you get to the end of that street because that octagonal sign tells me that uh, we're supposed to stop. So the brain begins to associate a meaning with shapes. And that's what we try to do in learning to read. Try to associate meaning, in this case phonemes, with the shape of the letter, the grapheme. And that's a very intensive process. Now, one thing we know is that females are better at it than males. And that's, again, because of our development as a species. Um, females essentially stayed in the cave with the offspring, had to teach them the language because there was no written language orally, had to tell them stories in order to keep them inside the cave because they wanted to run outside. That could be dangerous. Males, on the other hand, essentially went out hunting. And when you go out hunting, you've got to be very quiet. So they developed visual skills and spatial skills and temporal skills, but not very good at language skills because they didn't need them. So as a result of that, we find that females learn to read generally faster and acquire vocabulary faster in general, on the average, always exceptions, than males do. 
Males, on the other hand, acquire visual spatial skills faster and easier than females do. So that's left over from our development as a species. That's why we tend to find more boys in reading, remedial reading programs than girls, because we tend to measure success in reading by how girls do it. And since boys aren't as good at it, we think, well, they're not, you know, something must be wrong with their development of, of reading. So it's a very complex process. Eventually what we do is we train the brain to associate certain sounds with certain symbols and certain symbols with certain sounds. It's very labor intensive. Um, some brains are better at it than others. Uh, and a lot depends on what vocabulary, probably the best predictor of how well a, a young brain will learn to read is how well they speak the size of their vocabulary. That's why we tell young parents of toddlers, constantly talk to your child. Um, don't just put them in a room with a television because that's the worst thing you can do really. Um, have them near you if you're ironing or making a meal, talk to them, what do you think I'm doing? Ask them questions because you're trying to build a vocabulary. And the larger uh, spoken vocabulary that a brain has, the easier it is to learn to read. I say, uh, unfortunately, in too many homes, the television becomes the uh, source of, of, of talking. And um, that's not helpful at all because the, the child needs to hear uh, adult talking very slowly. In fact, we, as parents, we start out, you know, the, what we call, they speak parentese. And that's when you say, hello, dear, how are you today? we begin to pronounce our words very carefully. And what's going on is the brain is beginning to associate uh, not only uh, sounds with the, um, your expressions, but also understanding that there are nonverbal signs that you give me as the toddler whenever you're speaking. You make a different face when you say no than you do when you say yes. And I begin to register that. So meaning sometimes comes through body language. And that's where social and emotional learning has a great impact uh, on, uh, on, on learning, not just only to read, but learning a lot about uh, the universe around us. That's, it's all so important. Awesome. David, I know that we've all heard the statistics about the importance of reading proficiency by third grade. So I'll just outline some of the statistics quickly, like two thirds of students who cannot read proficiently by the end of fourth grade will end up in jail or on welfare. And over 70% of America's inmates cannot read above a fourth grade level. One in four children in America grow up without learning how to read. And students who don't read proficiently by third grade are four times likelier to drop out of school. And so I mentioned that I've got a struggling reader going into fourth grade this year, and we've really been on top of her reading. But can you explain how a child can get behind with reading so that a parent could recognize this and perhaps remediate this at home so they don't become one of these statistics? Well, as I said earlier, <clears throat> learning to read is very labor intensive. It's a skill, set of skills that the human brain has to acquire in order to read successfully. And like any skill, <clears throat> you only get good at it if you practice it. And uh, unfortunately, many of those children that you cited who are liable to end up in welfare or in worse, um, haven't had the benefit of somebody caring enough to make sure they are developing the ability to read. Um, too often, uh, it may be well-intentioned that the parent or guardian doesn't have enough time to devote to that, or there's um, other problems in the household, or domestic abuse or drugs or bullying um, uh, sibling that takes away from the time that would normally be used in, in, in normal discourse between the parent or the caregiver and the child. So, yeah, to answer your question, the best thing parents can do is keep exercising that skill at home. Uh, I think too many parents rely on schools to do everything. Um, it, you know, I often say that in loco parentis has never been truer than it is today. Schools don't just teach kids today, they raise kids. Uh, kids often come to school to get fed, to feel safe, 
And that is long before they're, they're worried about the curriculum. They've got to feel physically safe, emotionally secure before they begin to uh, think about higher order stuff, which is such as reading or learning some of the facts that we try to teach them in schools. So the best um, advice I can give to a parent is to do what you can to develop that skill. And not necessarily means sitting down and opening a book all the time and saying, reading stories to them. You want them to read the stories. You want them to talk to you. You should always, that's why I say uh, the conversation should be more about asking questions. What do you think I'm doing here? Why am I doing it? Tell me more about your day. Um, do, you, do you have any idea? You just use the word I haven't heard before. Do you know how it's spelled? Think questions like that, that constantly force the brain to make connections between what you hear and what you see, what you read. <clears throat> Can you explain how to build a child's vocabulary or their mental lexicon of spoken vocabulary? So how the brain stores clusters of closely associated words. It's in one of your books that you know, there's a chart that explains that the brain accesses these clusters easier. And this idea really helped me when I was working with my daughter with her reading. So as she was struggling with a word, I was actually going in her head and thinking, well, she doesn't have another closely associated word with that. And it really did help for me to attach that word to another word and then help her access mm -hmm. it. Can yeah. you explain this idea? Sure, let's start with a very basic concept about the human brain. The brain is a lean, mean, pattern-making machine. The brain is a pattern seeker. And why is it a pattern seeker? Because through patterns, it can determine whether things happening outside you are a threat or not. Remember I said the number one goal of the brain? Keep its owner alive. And it does that by constantly um, assessing input from around you and organizing it in such a way that it can say, well, yes, I've had, I heard that sound before. Say, take a siren, for example. And I know, I, I, I know what my owner did when he heard that siren or she, they, they reacted, uh, they got out of the way, uh, or they went to see what was going on or, or some other uh, sounds. The brain begins to organize itself and organize what it is learning into patterns. And that's true of vocabulary as well. One of the fascinating things we learned as we looked at what the brain was doing when a person was reading is that apparently the brain stores associated words in, similar, in close proximity to each other in the long-term storage sites. So um, if you're a carpenter, you have a lot of words for tools. Those tend to be all attached to one another or near one another in a, in a section of the brain that we can call the tool section or depending on what kind of words you are most exposed to, the brain will, will tend to associate those words and put them in this area that makes it easy to access. That's why I'm able to talk to you so quickly. I'm not stopping to say, what do I want to say to her next? Okay, can I find that word? It happens quickly because those words are so close together uh, in, in, the, in these long-term storage sites that access to them is very quick in, milli, in milliseconds, thousands of a second that happens. So uh, let's take advantage of that. Once we teach teachers, and almost every teacher is a reading teacher of some sort, regardless of their grade level. Um, and that's, that's why uh, students who can't read well past the fourth grade get in trouble because um, learning, we say grade three because at grade three, once you get out of grade three, learning shifts from learning to read to reading to learn. And so now reading becomes a critical tool for anything else that happens past that. And so if you're a poor reader, and if you're very good at hiding the fact that you're a poor reader, then you're going to keep lagging behind because um, teachers often don't explore how well you're reading their, their textbooks. So back to... Um, how do I help a struggling reader? If they're having trouble, you did exactly the right thing. If they're having trouble finding a word, see if you can think of a word that's closely associated with that. And say, do you know this word? Yes. Well, they, 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 they go together because of they have this common characteristic. Once you identify a common characteristic, 
that gives the cue to the brain that this needs to be stored near this word. These words need to be stored together. The brain's very clever at that. Um, and we didn't realize how clever was at it until we were able to do the imaging and see, see how that occurs. I just look at my child so differently when she's reading and I try to see, now that I have this understanding, I try to see like what's happening when she's thinking and I'm thinking of all these clusters of words. It, it just changed everything for me to, to have that understanding. It's powerful. Can you share the concept that you and Michael Toth wrote about in the power of student teams? So you show that student-led academic teaming elevates core instruction to a level of rigor far beyond the traditional classroom with um, and familiar grouping strategies. And now that students might be learning with distance learning, you can still do this with the, the Zoom. You can still have breakout sessions and use this strategy. So what was the main idea of that book? Uh, the main idea of, of that whole process stems from another one of my Suzerisms, and that is the brain that does the work is the brain that learns. And what we've discovered in classrooms, especially as you walk through them, and I've been in hundreds and hundreds of classrooms, um, especially in the secondary level, that the teachers are doing most of the work. It's still delivering uh, sage on the stage, and of course, it even gets more pronounced at the university level. But essentially, it's delivering information. And the student becomes a passive observer. Now, what we dis dis discovered in the book I wrote about engaging the rewired brain is that one thing technology has done is shown the learner how much they can understand by engagement. They have to engage with the technology, otherwise it's useless. And so the younger brain is developing a sense of engagement that I learn by engaging, by being part of the learning process. Well, if you're just sitting in the classroom taking notes, um, that's, not being, that's not engagement, very much engagement. And uh, often what happens is the information comes into your ears, out of your hand, into your notebook, without ever passing through the part of the brain that does thinking, the frontal lobe. Uh, and, and when you test the child, what the child does, they look at their notes, they load into temporary memory what they think they'll need to pass the test. And once you pass the test, it gets lost. It gets dumped out of, we call it a brain dump. It gets dumped out of working memory. And that's why teachers have this very frustrating experience of going back to a topic they taught two or three months ago and said, remember when we talked about that? And the kids, oh, I don't remember. That. And the reason they don't is they never saved it. It wasn't meaningful enough for them to save. It became a, it became a, uh, a process of just learning things long enough to pass the test. So in classrooms, in order to be successful, we realize we've got to tell teachers, especially those who've been around a while, you can't be doing the sage on the stage anymore. You've, if the brain that does the work is the brain that learns, the brains of the, the students should be doing the work, not yours. Mm -hmm. I often say that one of the reasons kids don't learn as much in schools is because teachers work too hard. And the kids know that. They'll say, hey, let's get it to do it again. Hey, teach, could you go with that one more time? And the teacher does. And that's why they mm -hmm. learn this stuff so well, because they're constantly going over and over it. But it's the student's brain that should be doing the work. So we discovered, and Michael Toth and his group at uh, LSI had a, um, a, a big part in, in putting together these research projects and going to small and large districts, uh, Des Moines, Iowa being the largest district they were in, to say if we could show teachers how to shift the burden of learning from them to the student, that would, things would be a lot more successful because kids today want to be engaged in their learning. If they're not, they'll turn to something that will engage them. So they'll have their, their digital device under the desk and doing something and showing you a face like they're paying attention when they're not at all because they don't feel engaged with you. So if they don't feel engaged with the teacher, they'll do something else. So over the last several years, we've had this program where we show teachers how to shift from teacher to student, to teacher to groups of students, to then students to students. Mm 
And that's, we call them academic teams. It's different from cooperative learning in that the team cannot succeed unless everyone participates. Mm -hmm. And what we find is some amazing things. First of all, we find that we're closing the achievement gap, that by having mixed groups, make sure the groups are well mixed, and the groups are only four or five students, that, that they, br they bring in other kids. Or what, do, what do you think of this? And they, so um, kids who normally would be passive in the classroom now become active. And when they become active, their brain becomes active. And when their brain becomes active, they begin to contribute to the group. So we have found in Des Moines, for example, that the achievement gap between students of color and white students was closing, and closing fairly rapidly over the several years. We have several years of evidence. Next thing is to make sure that what they do has academic rigor, because you still need to um, learn, learn the curriculum. And there are things that, ways to do that that challenge the brain. The brain loves a challenge. Remember, the brain is a pattern seeker. It's there to solve. It's a problem solver. And if, it does, if, if you don't give it problems to solve, it gets in trouble. So what we do is we give the groups a, a, a challenging problem to solve, which, has, which is connected to the curriculum. And that is how we raise, the, raise rigor, how we're making sure it's not just a social group, that it's not just kids exchanging stories about what they did last week, but actually focusing on the achieving a curriculum objective. So, that's, so that's, that's why we call them academic teams, because they're working towards solving an academic problem through social interaction, through emotional understanding of one another. And that's another thing we discovered, is that um, it builds social and emotional skills. <clears throat> because kids have to learn in that kind of group, not to just wait for their turn to talk, but to listen to what other people say. There's a big difference between the two. And also to recognize um, that so much communication is nonverbal and how important that, that is in, in working with others. That collaboration is much more productive than competition. So there are a lot of things that come out of this uh, that we were su actually surprised to learn through the uh, project, but delighted to understand that not only develop cognitive growth, but social and emotional growth as well were easily observable in these groups. And by the way, it also showed a deeper empathy and understanding for kids with learning, learning disabilities because we mixed them into the group. And it's amazing how some of the kids drew in the, 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 the learning, um, kid who had learned some learning problems. They made them contribute and said, what do you think about this? Yeah. And what we find is because they often, they recognize that they're not that great at learning, that they just sit quietly in the classroom. When they begin to talk about what they do know, they begin to realize, hey, I can contribute to this. Right. We, we also found it was a big um, uh, help for kids, uh, for ELL kids, because students who don't know the language very well don't want to speak it. But if you, and especially to an adult, because they feel they're going to be judged. I don't know. But within a group of their peers, they're more comfortable at trying out vocabulary. And, and what we found is sometimes the students would correct the other and say, but did you mean to say this? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the word I was looking for. So it, it was helpful in all, uh, in, in all kinds of situations, taking students of all, dis of all ranges of ability and language proficiency. And we, we thought we just had to put this to paper. I'm happy to tell you, by the way, it just won another award and oh, book from, wow. the, from the Florida Association of Publishers. Uh, just gave it a silver award uh, for its importance in, as a reference book in, in education. I can That's the second see. award we've won. <laughs> Very good. I can see it working really well with students, even in distance learning, with breakout sessions. It, it could all work well together. Yeah, so. And it, the, the, the great thing about it, too, is that it relieves the teacher of always trying to say, what am I gonna do next, what am I gonna do next, in terms of how am I gonna deliver this curriculum? You don't, you're not just telling students about what they need to learn, you're sharing it with them and having them solve the problem, having them come up with it. 
Uh, and by the way, we have to be careful with technology in this too, because students have learned that, that the internet's a great source of information, some of it reliable and some of it not, as you well know, in fact, a lot of it not. So you have to limit technology in this, in this environment so that kids are using their brains, their own brains, instead of their digital device. Got it, because they could just Google the answer and say, oh, this is- Yeah, what right, doing. that's what they do, yeah. <laughs> so right. if, they can't, if they can't Google the answer, the only place the answer is gonna come from is from up here. And you know what, they do work. The teacher gives them enough clues uh, to, uh, and occasionally the teacher may say, all right, I want you to go to this website because that's where you'll find out that little piece of information and then shut, shut your device off and come back to discussing it. So in that way it can help. But essentially, you want the kids' brains to do the work, not the digital device. Yep, because we want them to think. Yeah. So what about um, how this understanding helping students with their confidence levels? So have, how do you feel that it works with students to know how their brain works? Like, do you think they um, can become more confident as they know this? Or do you think this just helps teachers and parents? Oh, no, kids love to know how their brains work. We started that, we tested that, I tested that years ago uh, with, uh, I taught at Rutgers University and Seton Hall Universities for 10 years as an adjunct. And I would have, uh, I would ask my, my graduate students who are usually teachers already, in-service in teachers, to try some of these things. And one of the things I'd ask them to try <clears throat> is to teach a little bit about the brain to their students. And what we found was, Starting way down in kindergarten, kids love to find out about what's going on in their head. <clears throat> and of course, you, get, you can be more sophisticated as you move up to grade level. But generally speaking, students love to this information. They love to know what's going on in their head. And they love to know that they have some control over it, that they can understand how they learn to learn. They can learn how they learn. And when you know how you learn, boy, that's a powerful a bit of information to have because then when you're on your own, like when you get, if you go on to, uh, uh, to a technical institute or go on to a university or college, where very often you're on your own to learn things. If you know how you learn, if you know what your best methods of learning are, then that's, you can be much more successful as a, as a self-taught student. So generally speaking, I encourage, I always encourage teachers who come through this, um, uh, this process to, use the age appropriate language, but teach as much of this to your kids as you can. It's important for them. Um, let me give you an example with, with building principles. Okay. I think this is a very good example. Um, the emotional brain is totally developed by about the age of 10 to 12, a little earlier in girls, later in boys. So that means that the emotional part of the brain can do can work at 100% efficiency by the age of 10 and 12. The rational part of the brain, the frontal lobe, doesn't mature until 22 to 24 years of age. That's after most kids are out of college. Um, so the emotional brain is fully efficient at 10 to 12. 10 years later, the rational brain, part of it whose job is to control emotions, isn't working very well at 10 to 12. That's why you get a kid, two kids walking in opposite directions down a middle school corridor, one bumps into the other, the other turns, thinks it's an attack, and punches them. Right. All right. That's the emotional brain reacting. And it's not until the teacher says, come on, you're going to the principal's office, that the kid's sitting in the principal's office, that the rational brain pipes up and says, what did you do that for? <laughs> you know, that was just an accident. You're both, you're in a, you're in a crowded corridor. You don't even know this kid. Uh, why did you react that way? And then... They go to the principal's office, and the principal says, Johnny, what were you thinking? What was Johnny say? I don't know. I don't know. Right, because in fact, they weren't thinking. And now we're saying, well, you should know better. That's the most useless thing to say, because they can't know better at that point. Right. What we taught principals to do is stop and take this as a teachable moment and, and have the child understand the difference between the emotional brain and the logical brain and why one isn't doing its job yet because it's too young, while the other is fully doing its job. And that the next time someone uh, that happens, you bump into somebody, <clears throat> what I want you to do is spell your name backwards. Mm -hmm. And 
as they do that, don't tell them to count to 10 because they're going there at 10, boom, you know. You want to give them something that's, that they have to stop and engage the frontal lobe. Once you do that, the frontal lobe says, by the way, uh, don't do anything to that kid. You know, that was just a mistake and uh, everything's fine. By the way, your name spelled backwards is uh, uh, A-S. You need that delay to give the kick in the frontal brain, the frontal lobe, and give it a chance to assess was this kid really a threat to you? Was it an accident? Uh, and, and, and therefore, your response should be this. Your response should be, you know, mumble something and walk off and not turn around and sock the kid. So once you teach those kids though how their brain works, you'd be surprised how the behavior can, can change. Wow, that's amazing. It really is. I, and I'd heard of the, the fact that when you start counting or if you do do your name backwards, or if you do a math problem, something you have to think of, mm -hmm. you switch from the limbic emotional to the rational. To the frontal of. lobe, right, yeah. That and, and that gives it a chance to assess the situation, say, you know what, this was not a threat on you. This was an accident, move on. Wow. And I've, I've, I've actually received, because uh, I've done workshops with principals and assistant principals, I received emails over time from some of them saying, hey, I didn't think you're, you're uh, explaining the brain and probably your name backwards would work, but it did. Yeah. What about some myths that you think we should be aware of that are still out there? I know that we could look some up, but what, what are ones that you think we yeah, should? We call, yeah, we call them neuro myths. Mm -hmm. One of the big ones is that we only use 10 or 15% of our brain uh, and that's that's silly. Uh, why would we have all this wasted tissue if you're going to use 10% of it? No, we use all of our brain um, almost all the time that we, even when we're sleeping. I mean, our brain is never doing nothing. Uh, it's always doing something. Uh, in fact, it's busier when we're asleep. Your brain is about 20 25% more active when you're asleep than when you're awake because it needs that time to clear out stuff in working memory, to store stuff that you want to keep in long-term memory, to assess all your body systems. So it's very, it's very, so no, we use, um, uh, we use our brain all the time. Now, uh, one thing I say to teachers sometimes when they come up with this one, is that true? I say, look, if you are just a teacher that lect does nothing but lecture, um, then chances are you're only occupying maybe 10% of that kid's brain. And the other portion of the brain is being devoted to doing something else, writing a love note or um, checking what's going on on the internet. Um, that may be true, but no, we're always using all of our brain. Some of it more often, some parts of it more often than not. I'm talking to you right now. So my language centers are going full blast um, in order for me to access the vocabulary I need. And, my, and the word, word form area, uh, which forms as a result of reading, uh, that's what happens, by the way. Your brain has to form a whole new section of the brain called the word form area in order to make the associations between sound and, and symbol. Uh, they're very active. Uh, my frontal lobe is very active right now because I'm thinking, how am I going to present this information? Mm -hmm. My cere cerebellum, which controls physical motion, isn't very active right now because I'm sitting. All it's controlling is my hand motions because I talk a lot with my hands. So that's one of them. Um, uh, another one is that um, uh, sleep is not that important. Sleep is very important. And um, because that's the time when the brain sorts out what it can let go from working mem temporary memory and what it needs to encode from working memory into long-term storage. Um, we go through what we call the REM cycles, four or five of them in the course of an evening. It's during those REM cycles that information that you learn that day gets stored. So, and those REM cycles occur over seven to eight hours. Now, what we find is the high school kids, because of technology, are getting only an average of five and a half to six hours sleep. So what's happening is they're losing two REM cycles, which occur toward the end. And so they're not, they're not getting full, uh, the full capacity of their brain to store information because the brain says, I got two more REM cycles coming up. What, you're waking up already? Uh, that I'm just gonna lose that information. So that is, and that's very, talk about teaching the brain to students. That's very important to tell middle and high school kids. 
how important sleep is, because if you want to remember what you learned today, then you've got to have enough sleep to give the brain time to encode during the REM cycle what you learned today from working memory, which is temporary, into long-term memory. So if, if our memories are consolidated in sleep, wouldn't like a trauma incident, so I heard someone say once that if someone has a, an incident that they don't want to remember to delay sleep, is, do you think that that would hold true? That if they had an incident they don't want to remember, that it would delay sleep? No, that you delay sleep so that you don't consolidate that memory. So do you think that, yeah. does that make sense? <clears throat> well, uh, to a degree. First of all, um, most of the time we remember the worst and best things that happened. We don't remember the mediocre. Can you remember what you had for lunch a week ago Thursday? Yeah, because I eat the same thing every day. Well, if you eat the same thing every day, that, <laughs> that doesn't count. But <laughs> if you have a different thing every day, no, no, Thursday, what did I have the ham sandwich or was it the tuna or was it the salad? You know, because it wasn't important unless you get sick from it. Yeah. If you get sick from it or if it was a special occasion, like someone's birthday, then you're likely to remember it because the emotional kicks in. So whenever you have emotions attached to a situation, there's a much greater likelihood that you'll remember it. Now, if you have a tragic situation, a traumatic situation, a car accident, the sudden death of a loved one, something like that, you're going to remember it because the emotions attached to that are so strong. And that's the function of the amygdala, part of the brain in the limbic system that detects emotions and um, determines whether if there's enough emotion attached to this memory to save it. You'll remember. Now, um, delaying sleep isn't going to change that because that, that, um, that trauma will hang into what we call working memory. It's called preoccupation until it gets stored. Mm. And it eventually will get stored. Now, trying to prevent that from happening is extremely difficult because the emotional part of the brain is so powerful that... Um, it uh, delaying sleep is only going to make it worse because then you're going to become crankier mm -hmm. and uh, you'll become more more stressful because when you delay sleep, cortisol, the stress hormone, begins to build up in your blood and that's not good. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. David, is there anything important that you would like to close with that you think we've missed about the brain, maybe some of the other books that we haven't mentioned? Well, I think what's important is for those who call themselves educators, and this is both parents and teachers, have to understand one thing. If your job is to try to educate someone in front of you by teaching them something, you've got to know how their brain works. The more you know how their brain works, the more successful you can be at that. Because there's a big difference between teaching and just telling somebody what you know. Telling somebody what you know is just storytelling. It doesn't mean anything's happening in the brain of the person you're talking to. They may be thinking of when my next vacation is going to be, or what, am I going to have steak for dinner tonight, or am I going to have chicken? Uh, they can look at you like they're paying attention, but that's where behavioral psychology throws us off the path. Because people have free will, and they can pretend like they're doing something when in fact something else is going on. So uh, I encourage uh, parents who are the, the first teachers, of, remember they're the, they're the primary teacher, parents and anybody who's in education, whether they be kindergarten, preschool, all the way up to graduate level, to find out more about this whole new uh, area of scientific inquiry called educational neuroscience. And educational neuroscience is that branch of science that looks at ways to apply what we learn about the brain to, to, um, to education, to helping people learn, to the pedagogy of learning. And when you do, it's amazing the, how you can be transformed, just as you have suggested. It tells you, it gives you insight into your own kids, it gives you insight into your students or your teacher, and it gives you insight into your own brain. And boy, once you have that kind of insight, your life changes and your success as a teacher and a parent will change as well. There's too much good stuff out there. And what I, I still see too often in classrooms particularly is the teachers trying to work with a 2020 brain with a 1970s or 1980s kit bag. And it just doesn't work. It's a very different brain out there today.
Oh, I love all of this. Thank you so much, David, for taking the time out of your schedule to speak with me today. If anyone wants to find your books, I've put all the links in the show notes. Thank you for creating this. I couldn't have done the past six, seven years without your book. So thank you so much for this, um, for helping educators and students around the world to understand how their brain works to help improve our results at home, schools, and the workplace. Thank you, David. So, so let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, do, you have a, do you have a nagging question in your head about the brain that you haven't asked? That's a good one. I have so many questions. Well, right now it's sorry to um, take you off guard this way, but no, no, it, well, it's making me think, right? So, I I just listened to a podcast this morning. There's these two Australian guys that I want to have on on my show. I like to listen to what other people are doing, and they have a neuroscience background, and uh, they're they're on doing right now on habit breaking. And I always do habit breaking in January, you know, start the, the new year, make sure you're um, eating right. And I have charts that I break habits with. But what would you suggest would be an easy way to break the, the habit loops that we create in our brain? Well, that's, uh, that's a tough one, because it depends what the habit is. It depends whether it's physiological, or psychological, or both, um, whether it's social. Let's take, for example, smoking. Mm -hmm. Smoking is tough to break. As a, why? Because it is psychological. Mm -hmm. I like to have something in my mouth. Mm -hmm. It's physiological because it alters your body chemistry by having you become addicted to nicotine and other um, chemicals that are in the cigarette smoke. And it's social. Very often people light up after a meal to, and, and a conversation at dinner. Uh, so there's a, there's a social component. I think the social part of it has decreased dramatically in recent years as smoking has become, as where places you can smoke has become more and more limited. So the social aspect, so people do it more in their homes now than they can outside because they can't do it outside except maybe in, in open air. But the psychological and uh, so the first thing the person has to understand is, is this habit psychological, physiological, sociological, or emotional? In some cases, it's, uh, that can be a component as well. And once you, you know which combination that is, then you can begin to decide what's the best way to address it. And uh, that requires some self-reflection on the part of the, of the person uh, who wants to break the habit. Why, why am I doing this? Because it makes me feel good? Because it makes me think well of myself, that's psychological? Because I interact better with my spouse or significant other when I do that? What's the reason I do it? And that's often the toughest question to answer for people who are in, in, some, in some habits. Why am I doing this? How do they get started doing it? There's another, there has to be a lot of self-reflection. You can't break a habit through external forces alone. They don't work. They have to be it's in. It's, it's the <clears throat> hardest thing to do. You know, I know uh, I've read some books on it. Changeology is one and, you know, replacing one habit with another habit. But this is probably the most difficult work. It's, you know, you're addicted to technology. You check your your phones all the time. There's so much to think about with this, but these questions are good. I didn't think about it that way. Uh, the, the, uh, the technology addiction, which has become now, I, I suspect in the next time we write, we write the, uh, uh, the statistical manual of, of disorders, I think te technological uh, compulsion uh, will, be, will be one of the disorders because there are people who, and we've done studies of this, you know, I did, uh, I, I did a review one time of, uh, I was asked to review a, uh, uh, an, a, a peer review, an article regarding technology and uh, the study involved taking away the cell phones from um, freshmen, college freshmen. And the deal was 
<clears throat> if we could keep your phone and you could stay away from your cell phone for seven days, you would get $100. Wow. wow. So there was an incentive. Mm -hmm. The uh, pool was, a, I think, about 125 students who agreed to this. After the first day, 15% showed up and said, I got to have my phone back. Keep you $100. <laughs> At the end of the week, only 7% lasted. 93% fell out along the way, even with the temptation of $100. Because they said, I just can't, I can't do it. I, I, uh, I, I can't sleep if I don't know what emails are waiting for. I can't sleep if I don't know if somebody left me a message. And so I, I'm, I've been totally exhausted these entire three days. I've got to have that phone back. Yeah. So that shows you the compulsion uh, uh, that technology has caused in, in us. Uh, and you know what? We existed fine without it. Yeah. Right? There was, back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day, you had to make a phone call. And you went up to a phone. You picked you, you rotary dialed it. Yeah. Uh, or maybe pushed a few buttons on your princess phone. And you connected with somebody. And you know what? Sometimes you say, you know what? That's not that important. I can call them tomorrow. I can wait to come till tomorrow. Today, it's this compulsion for instant access. By the way, that's an ego thing. That's the psychological component of that is ego. That it, it builds your ego to know that someone wants you now. Mm -hmm. So, so you've got you to address why I'm doing it and what, far, what, what system, what, what brain systems are being affected by that habit. And by the way, I should warn you, there's a lot of junk out there. Behavioral psychology is one of the areas where there's so much junk. It's people's opinions. It has nothing to do with scientific research whatsoever. It's like this pandemic thing, you know, people coming up with crazy ideas and theories that are not, that are not based in science. Mm -hmm. And um, you've, you've got to rely on, uh, on science to help us through this thing. And through breaking your habits, too. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for that. I hope they gave you some insights. Absolutely. I got to listen to it and write it down again. When I edit these, it, I learn more than what I'm doing the interview because then I can reflect. So. Exactly. Right. And make connections to things you already know. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, David. My pleasure. Nice talking with you.